What up, what up, what up, what up? It's me, L Teddy 27. Good night, dude. Right about the hood. Oh, dear God. I'm already eating the drink. Look at damn mess. It's just a damn mess. Please no. And yes, me, no. What up, what up, what up, what up, what up, what up? What's good, people? What's up? It's me. I'm L Teddy 27. I am back. We are here for a review. This is going to be a different review. This is going to be our review for the HBO original film, Between the World and Me. Now, this film is based on an original book by Ta-Nehisi Coates. If you don't know who um, Ta-Nehisi Coates is, he's an extraordinary author, um, black man, um, intellectual, uh, very revered for his uh, work in um, writing and um, and you know just the commentary that he adds to um, the the fabric of American culture with regard to talking about what it is to be black in these yet to be United States of America. So, and I, when I saw that the film was coming out, I did read the book. And um, I was very excited about the film when it was coming out. So I made it a point to tell myself, you got to not only watch the film, but you got to give your people a good review of the film. Now, um, if you have not watched it, it's available on HBO Max. For those of you people who don't necessarily uh, pay for HBO, you know, all your other little platforms where you go to find and you know. Hit me in the comment section and I'll tell you where you can go to get it for free. But, you know, your fire stick people and your other nefarious um, websites that you can go to to get any show imaginable. Yeah, there is on all of those. So <laughs> anyway, um, do what you can. Uh, it is a much see. It is not much. Must see. I will say this is the type of film that you sit down and you watch with the family. If you have a family, you want mom, dad, children, mom mom children dad dad children whatever your family makeup looks like this is a film that you as a black family sit down and you watch it for and for all ages and i think it's very important that um these conversations are had amongst us as um a black people so i wanted to get all of that out all the preliminaries out, all the introductions out um and delve right in so we start off they let us know when it was filmed this um the uh, movie was um, the film was, um, you know, taped in August of this year, 2020. And um, it, they, they have these sections where, um, you know, <clears throat> they have the writing um, that flashes across the screen unless you know different sections. So the first thing I wrote down was the first section, which was entitled, Dear Son, I Write to You in Wisdom. And if you read this um, book, this comes directly from the book. Now, we start off with Joe Morton. Most of you know him as Papa Pope. He was Olivia Pope's uh, father on um, Scandal. If you go back on, um, if you go back some time, he's the guy who was supposed to marry um, Whitley Gilbert on A Different World, and um, she ended up choosing Dwayne, him, Joe Morton. Anyway, um, he starts off, and um, he starts by, you know, speaking directly to his son, and he's talking to the son, um, who's 15-year-old, about um, an incident where he found out that Michael um, Brown and Michael Brown's killers ended up not being convicted and how as a father he had to go in and sit down and um, now these are the I, I'll be honest with you these are the words of um, Tallahassee Coates but also littered in there is also the words of the individuals themselves there was a cavalcade of celebrities and um, artists and musicians and people in in um, you know in pop culture and black culture um that you know you know who they are that appeared on this film and um there was both the words of Tallahassee coach from the book infused with the words of those individuals when um and their personal experiences and it and it you know seamlessly you know navigates between the two and so sometimes it gets difficult to Figure out what's the words of Tana Hesse Coates and what's the words of that individual. But I don't think it get, it takes away from the from the film. It doesn't take away from um, the experiences. It doesn't take away from any part of what is being um, said. Simply because the experience of Black people here in these yet to be United States of America is a shared experience that you know almost all of us have. You you can talk to one person and seem like they have an identical story to yours regardless of what part of the country they grew up in almost um you know regardless of you know the age the the stories are told time and time over so it's very um timely and um it, it just fits 
So you see Joe Morton, he's talking about when his son uh, was listening to the news and um, followed is, um, is and, and was told that the convict, the killers of Michael Brown were not going to be convicted and how um, the son went up to the room and just started crying. And then after a while, instead of coming in there and comforting the son, he was like, I didn't do that because there is no comfort for being a black uh, person living in this country. There is sometimes no solace and comfort in what it means to be black in this country. And so rather than just comfort, he just basically said, listen, you have to learn to live in this fucked up ass country. You have to learn to live, exist, and be authentically you in this world. This is the world that you live in. This is the set of um, rules that you have presented for um, in front of you. This is the set of, you know, uh, um, everything um, about life that you have to deal with. You got to learn to live with it. I can't come. I can't take it away from you. I can't magically tell you it's going to get better. You just got to learn to deal with it. And that became a prevalent theme throughout this film. Joe Morton then becomes almost... I don't want to necessarily say narrator, but but maybe a pseudo narrator in that he becomes the agent and conduit by which we navigate through different segments of this particular film. We next see Jarrell Jerome and Jarrell Jerome talked about being 11 years old and living in Baltimore and growing up and, um, you know, me being met with um, met by some guys who were on the corner on the block. And put, having a gun brandished and put away and brand, brandished again and letting him know real quick, hey, your life could be taken at the blink of an eye and coming to grips with that. And then you had Angela Bassett that came up, then navigating um, you through um, talking to a child about growing up, thinking about this American dream and, and, and looking at what was taught to be the American dream that white people had the privilege of having with the picket fences and the great um, neighborhoods and this, that, and the third, and knowing as a black person that that is not your reality, even if you come into money, even if you, you know, come into, you know, what people call the American dream, that is still not going to be your dream because at the blink of an eye, it can all be uh, snatched away from you. We then see Yara Shahidi, Shahidi, excuse me, and Angela Davis. Love Angela Davis. Love Angela Davis. But then they, I love this um, topic. They talked about how um, as a black child in school during the month of February, when they rule out the black history, um, the black history, um, you know, curriculum and whatnot, there's always all this focus on simply the civil rights era. And it's like black people, black, black people, but white people, in their um, caucasity, we'll make that a word, <laughs> um, wants to constantly relive when black people, people were being beaten. And not that we should forget, but it's almost like they celebrated. They show this to you over and over and over and over and over. And they always want to highlight the black people who were nonviolent. This is what they were talking about. And how they always want to um, highlight the fact that black people weren't resistant and they protested even in the face of the dogs and in the face of getting beat as if to kind of train you into thinking this is how you protest you let us beat you you let us sick your dogs on you and eventually maybe in the sweet by and by you'll get some change they don't try to highlight the Malcolm X's of the world who said we're not here for it and so and the Davis and Yara Shahidi started talking about no we were here for the Malcolm X's of the world who were like nope we're here for it. And so it was so great to hear that because you do get this this almost like they are celebrating the atrocities that were done to black people instead of chronicling the history, all of the history. Then we get to the next segment where um, um, called Meeting the Mecca, where um, in the book, Tennessee Coates talks about um, going to Howard University and um, and so forth. And um, there was this beautiful black woman, I can't remember her name right now, but she gave um, words on the experience of going to Howard University and just basically what it felt like, not just at Howard University, but at almost any HBCU that you could think about across the nation. And so um, in her speaking through the words of Ta-Nehisi Coates, she was telling her own stories. And all of these people, by them speaking the words of Ta-Nehisi Coates, they were telling their truly their own authentic stories. They were telling them, not just Ta-Nehisi Coates, but the stories of Black America. It was just so beautifully done 
using the words of Tennessee coach, but using the voices of these prominent black figures. And it's so hard. And even though they a phenomenal job was done doing it, but um, to just talk about the experience of being at a black college and what that feels like and all that that encapsulates and incorporates and everything that goes along with that. It's, so, you know, it's just it's such a it, it's so hard to put into words, but it's just, it's something you got to experience. You got to feel. And if you are not truly and authentically black, you may not get it. You may be standing there in the midst of all of it and look like, OK, what's all the hype about? But if you know, you're looking like, what do you mean? What the hype? Yeah, it's one of those moments. Anyway, listen, I thought I was going to make it through the whole film without them taking me out. But the first time they took me out was when they had chat with chat with Bozeman speaking at the Howard University commencement ceremony. That was the first time I had to pause the film because they took me out. All the way out. I was like, y'all not going to get me this early in the film. Even though it wasn't that early in the film, I was like, y'all already get me. And they got me. They got me. They, that was the first time they got me. And I was crying like a baby. So then we um, saw Mahershala Ali. He came and he began to speak about black love and falling in love in college. And every time he fell in love in college, he um, every time he fell in love in college, it taught him his capacity to love and what love truly meant. And it taught him more about um, some, uh, more about himself than what he knew before and how he had um, birthed his child. Um, and ten has a coach that is while in college with his mom and the beauty of black women in all of their various shades, forms and colors and so forth. And what that was like and, and, and essentially about how a parent in, inevitably gets to the point where they know that they have to survive for the sake of their child and their survival is paramount because of that um, child. Um, then we got to the point where we had MJ Rodriguez and Kendrick Sampson. They spoke about um, the history of PG County and what that meant and the PG County um, Police Department and how nefarious they were in the history of the PG County Police Department and all of the atrocities that have come, come at the wake of the PG County Police Department. And they narrated the story of um, him being pulled over by the um, by the police, not knowing whether or not he was going to be another, you know, name on the list of people killed by PG County. Then there was this guy and there was this guy that began to talk about um, the, a young man named Prince Jones who was killed by PG County. Um, and um, he talked about how when Prince Jones died and this was him, you know, giving the words of Tennessee Coates, um, his son was only a month old and his, um, how that was his friend and how this was a human being, someone who he loved, someone who was just being a human being, being a black man with all of his vices and all of his love and all of his insecurities and all of his strengths and all of these wonderful things that make us um, human beings who we are. He was taken out by another member of the PG County Police Department. And um, there was a little moment there where I thought there was some allusion to them having their own, um, him and um, even in the book, I felt that way. It was some allusion to Prince and him having their own little thing together. Anyway, but I um, no, but um, then it um, was, it came to light that the officer ended up getting off and returned back to work and nothing happened to the officer. And then we had a poet that, um, that came on and gave spoken word about the whole um, Prince Jones death and murder by PG County Police Department. And the fact that PG County Police, the man who killed him was an officer that was black. And a lot of the leadership down at PG County Police Department is black as well. And it shed light on, you know, it's not just, you know, white police officers, it's us, it's police in general. It's the whole criminal justice system and policing as a whole that is the problem. And it was great um, to watch, great spoken word here, phenomenal. Um, Courtney B. Vance then came on and spoke about 9-11 and spoke about Lower Manhattan and how um, even though they turned um, Lower Manhattan ground zero after 9-11, how it had already been ground zero because Lower Manhattan is where um, slaves were auctioned 
you know, way back during slavery time. That was one of the main places where slaves were auctioned. And how, yeah, Lower Manhattan is known as the financial district for a reason because it started as a financial district where slaves were auctioned. And, it, you know, it was just phenomenal hearing that and, and learning on um, those things. I remember when I read the novel and I learned, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And just hearing all of these things and just being empowered, it just makes you just understand everything that being Black in America is and how we live in this state of of just always, it's always a fight. And they talk about this later, we'll get to that a little bit later, but just as a, as a Black person in this country, it's always a fight. It's never... As much as even people with money, even people with who seem well off, it's never a moment where you can just say, oh, I can sit back. I've made it. Oh, my privilege is going to get me through. That's never a moment. Even when you think there is, white America quickly reminds you, hey, boo, <laughs> you forgot who you are? <laughs> Go talk to Bill Cosby. They remind him. Go talk to Tiger Woods. They remind him. Every time black people try to think they've arrived, they're reminded real fast that they, that they haven't. Anyway, um, then Wendell Pierce um, spoke about an incident where a white woman pushed um, pushed his child who he was walking in the stroller and how he was ready to defend his child to the, you know, <laughs> to death if needed. And how it, you know, his child was looking in horror because he'd never seen his dad that angry, but understanding that an error sometimes is needed. And I wrote down a quote that they said, they said, not all of us can be Jackie Robinson. Meaning not all of us, and not that Jackie Robinson was perfect, but not not all of us can just sit back and allow things to happen to us and just say, you know what, I'm going to turn on the cheek. You know what, I'm going to look aside. We all don't have that capacity. I knew I don't have that capacity. And so um, I thought it was so great in that moment to be said because so many times you hear about these people, you hear about these great figures, these names in history, and they talk about, oh, so-and-so was great. But even that person had moments of error. They had moments of um, where they might have taken a misstep and different things like that. And they talked about, unfortunately for Black people, an a, a slight error can cost you your life sometimes. Whereas our white counterparts, they don't have to worry about a lot of things that we end up having to worry about. And, and I thought that was important to be said. Another thing I love throughout the film is these wonderful images we kept seeing of black fathers with their children. And so often you don't see a lot of that or when the story is told about uh, black families, it's always, a, there's a lot made about the deadbeat dad, but shots out to all of the black fathers out there taking care of their children. Um, and, and I loved seeing that. The next section that came up was, um, it had to be blood. And Oprah comes on and she speaks in Oprah fashion about what it means to be black in America and how America has never valued us as a people, how we've always struggled, um, struggle. She was, she said, I can't say anything to make you feel like it's going to get any better. I can't say anything to make you feel like it's, you're going to somehow make it and you ain't going to have to worry about nothing. That's not your reality. And that's coming from somebody in the three comma club. And I thought it was so important that Oprah Winfrey, a billionaire in these yet to be United States of America, spoke to that part um, of the book saying, listen, I don't care. How much, which was to basically let you know, okay, how much you, money you think you amass or how you've arrived or financially, how more, you know, how much popularity you have, how much the white people see it for you. I still can't make you be a black go away. I cannot make your struggle go away. And they talked about always having the wind in your face, having to walk with the, or run with the wind in your face or with the um, dogs at your heels. It's always a struggle. And I thought it was so beautiful uh, when it was said, um, I didn't want you to be twice as good. I just wanted you to understand that you're going you're gonna to have to fight through the struggle. You are going to have to be as great as you are, the struggle notwithstanding. And I thought that was a great, um, that was a great line there. Um, keep it on. Um, the last thing I wrote down what Oprah said was the quote when she said, you do not have the privilege of living in ignorance. Whereas a lot of white people can be ignorant to the black people across America because their white privilege allows them to just be oblivious to everything going on. Whereas as black people, 
we don't have the option <laughs> to be ignorant of white America and what they got going on and who we are as black people. Because what they got going on directly affects what we have going on in a lot of regards. Then we saw, you know, a couple people come on and they spoke um, of, you know, what it means to just be a part of the black diaspora. And they 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 gave the words about when he spoke about being at the um, airport and bumping into another black man, you know, by mistake and being like, um, oh, my bad. And, and the other black man being like, oh, don't worry about it. Um, you good. And I think we all as black people experience that in that it was said that all of us have this commonality, this common bond from living through the struggles of being a black person in America and having always having to suffer at the um, hand of this country. And since all of us have suffered through that, we all have this common bond between us. We may not have ever met each other in our lives, but you walk by a black person, you be like, you give the head nod or something like that. It's like, and y'all, and you be like, you know him now, I don't know him, but he's another black person. You know, hey, hey, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so we all feel that all the time. So then um, the next section was called A Visit with Two Mothers. And let me tell you something. This was hard. This section of the film was very hard. It was very hard. I'm telling you, you need to make sure when you get to this portion of the film, please have your, your no, I ain't going to even say your Kleenex. You need to have a rag because you are going to be bawling. Do you hear me? Bawling. When I say bawling, I, am, I mean like bawling. I mean like bawling. You know, your eyes cry. Anyway, so we first see uh, when he went and interviewed um, Prince Jones, the guy who died, his mother. His mother's name was Dr. Jones. Felicia Rashad did that part and talked about who Prince Jones was. One of the things that I wrote down was, because at this point I was just boohoo crying. It just it made no sense. When she said, quote, he had a family. And that stuck with me because so many times you hear about, you hear the names of all these people and they focus so much on the death. And, and 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 the atrocity that happened all the while they they have a family there are people that are there at the courthouse when the case comes up at um behind the police line worried about their loved ones they're the ones who have to get rid of all of their clothing after the funerals they're the ones that have to go identify the body and things like that and so it just it stuck with me it, when they said when she said he had a family and i was just yeah at that point you couldn't stop it. Then there was the interview with Breonna Taylor's mother. I don't even got to tell you. It was a lot. It, I, I, it took me all the way out. Especially when she began to describe how, you know, they were there all night long. She didn't know nothing about her daughter. All night, went to go get coffee, so forth and so on. And then the next morning at 11 o'clock, she was like, okay, but so where's my daughter? And they were like, oh, your daughter's still in the apartment. I was too through. Oh, I was done. Because that meant they had this woman's dead daughter laid up in this apartment all those hours on hours on hours on hours trying to cover up their tracks. I was done. I, 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 <laughs> it, I, it took me a while. I had to go away from the film for a moment and come back. Then after that, they took me out again. The last 10 minutes before you were that. The, in the last 10 minutes, the first five minutes of the last 10 minutes, you have this uh, montage of pictures along with music and so forth. And you see black people protesting and you see protests that go on around the world about, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and um, you know, police brutality in this country and police profiling in the civil um, criminal justice system here in America. You saw things going on and protests all over the country. And it was so beautiful. I mean, the cinematography in the film is phenomenal. But it was so beautiful and so hard to watch because you saw everything that was the beauty of black people. And I love my people. I love black people. You saw all shades, colors, shapes, and sizes of black people, the black experience, all of us. But you couldn't escape in the midst of that beauty. You could not escape the horrors and atrocities that black people have to face simply for being who they are, simply because of their beauty, simply because we exist. And while you are so proud and you're so happy and you're so uplifted when know, knowing that you are a part of the black diaspora, 
there's still that fear that has been the the heartbeat of this entire film, reminding you we can't escape what it means to be black in this country. <clears throat> we can't escape the fact that we can fall victim to another atrocity. We can't escape the fact that there's a whole genocide of our people in these yet to be United States of America. And so while, like I said, it was so beautiful to watch, <clears throat> it was it was it was it was hard to watch. And I found myself crying again watching that part. And then at the end, um, in the, the section called A Final Wisdom, Tana Hesse Coates comes on himself and he speaks for himself, his own words. And um I I, I dare not try to recapitulate Tennessee Coates' poignant words. I mean, he's an orator. He is a wordsmith. He is an intellectual. So like I said, me trying to recapitulate his words, I'm not going to try to do it. I will say it is important enough for you to go look it up and go watch what he had to say at the end of this film. And it went on from there. And uh, let me say, I am so glad that they made this film. I think that it is one of those films that a black family should watch together um, because you see all of these celebrated black faces but it, 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 it's non-fiction it's not um, some movie where they're acting out parts or something even though you know they were to a certain degree but it is telling the story the cautionary tale of what it means to be black here in America and I think that every black family should hear it see it experience it um, good and bad um, y'all go watch the film get in the comment section let me know how y'all felt about it I thought it was a great film shouts out to HBO Tennessee Coach um, oh, the director it's a black woman who's the director I cannot think of her name right now please somebody put it in the comment section I have no notes in front of me and I should have wrote it down oh my god I'm so sorry I'm so sorry I'm so sorry but I should know the name of this black lady um, go watch it let's get in the comment section y'all know y'all tell me how what y'all thought about the film that's all I got for y'all. Until next time, thank y'all for coming. Y'all drive safely. We out.